Advancing the cause of liberty takes more than just coming up with ideas. It means making them happen. This is Society and the State. Life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. Now, your hosts, Connor Boyack and Brian Hyde. Welcome, everybody, to Society in the State. This is episode 132. And back, uh, it's been about 50 or 60 episodes. In fact, we'll link to it uh, on today's show notes page, which is societyinthestate.com slash 132. We chatted with Nate Wessler, uh, an attorney with ACLU, about a really significant data privacy case. So today, we are joined by Marina Lowe, who's Legislative and Policy Counsel at the ACLU of Utah in my stomping grounds, to do a little bit of follow-up analysis, what happened with that Carpenter case, and then what's been done ever since then. So Marina, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Let's maybe uh, start. We've had a lot of new listeners come on board since uh, a while back when we interviewed Nate about the Carpenter case. Can you give maybe a quick rundown of uh, this is a U.S. Supreme Court case dealing with data privacy? Maybe uh, do a little intro for us and then we can unpack a little bit its significance. Yeah, so Mr. Carpenter's legal troubles began um, when uh, the police in his state were tracking a series of burglaries. And they somehow, Mr. Carpenter came onto their radar and they suspected him of being an individual who was implicated in those burglaries, but they needed more evidence. So what they did is they went to his cell phone provider and requested his cell phone records. And his cell phone provider just handed them over because there wasn't any requirement that they um, first have a warrant from law enforcement before they did so. So they just handed over these records. Um, the police were then able to establish that based on the location where Mr. Carpenter's cell phone had been and the pings that it had um, created from cell phone towers in the area, they were able to pinpoint that he had, in fact, been at the very same locations where this string of burglaries had occurred. And so on the basis of that, then went ahead and charged him with that crime. Now, Mr. Carpenter was was lucky that he had a good uh, criminal defense attorney. He also had the assistance of the ACLU National. And uh, there was an objection made on his behalf to the fact that the cell phone providers just handed over this information without a warrant. And the case made its way through the court system and finally made it before the Supreme Court, who issued a ruling. Um, I believe it was in the 2017 term. It was a fairly narrow ruling, but nevertheless stated that Uh, individuals do have an expectation of privacy in their cell uh, service location information and that a warrant should have been secured by law enforcement before they requested this information from the cell phone service providers. There were were a lot of eyeballs on this case, right? There was a lot of interest around the country watching um, the the Carpenter case uh, make its way to the Supreme Court and the final the hearing the, the final ruling the opinion that was given there um, so let's maybe put that in a little bit of context right because this ruling was as you point out it was narrow dealt with just the cell phone location information but put it in context of of kind of the court's previous precedent and this idea of the third party doctrine. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the third party doctrine, because I think that's actually the key thing that most folks who were really interested in data privacy were focused on. Let's talk a little bit about the third party doctrine. Um, This was a doctrine that was developed by the courts a long time ago in the 70s, back long before we were talking about cell phones and other sort of technological devices that we use now. And the idea is this, that of course you have protection under the Fourth Amendment when law enforcement wants to search in your home, in your car, your other belongings. But there's this exception. When you share your information voluntarily with a third party, the courts held under the third party doctrine, you're giving up that expectation of privacy that you once had because you're knowingly and voluntarily giving up that information and sharing it with another. So the courts have held in a string of cases when, for example, you engage in banking, you're voluntarily sharing your information with the bank. And so if law enforcement wants to get access to that information, they don't need to provide the bank with a warrant. Now, if we sort of spring forward several decades to a time in which everybody carries a cell phone with them at all times, um, when most of our most private information is contained on a cell phone, information about you know, the calendar, calendar entries that we might have that detail the, the 
uh, minutia of our everyday activities, um, the location that we might go, the churches we're visiting, the meetings we're attending, the stores we're visiting. All of this paints a picture about all of our habits and our private activities. And so, you know, you have to sort of ask the question, does the third party doctrine really still have relevance? I, you know, most of us feel that we have to have a cell phone in order to survive in the modern world. It's sort of a necessary requirement for most people's work, um, for their personal lives, for the ability to communicate with their children, um, to be reachable in case of an emergency. So most people don't really view that as, um, as an option, whether or not you can have a cell phone. And so sharing information with your cell phone service provider, um, such as the calls that you make and the locations that you happen to be when your phone is in your pocket doesn't really feel like voluntary sharing. Mm -hmm. And so what everybody I think was really looking for in the Carpenter case was a determination by the Supreme Court that when we're talking about this kind of electronic information in today's technologically advanced world, the third party doctrine does not really still apply in the same way that it once did and certainly does not serve as a bar to the need to secure a warrant. Now, to, to be clear, when you were talking about the sensitive information on our phones, the calendar appointments, photos, and so forth. Just to be clear and correct me if you see it any differently, um, if officers under current case law uh, throughout the country wanted to get that information that is stored locally on the, the phone, that that uh, would still be subject to the warrant requirement. But when everyone's kind of connected to the cloud, they're using Apple's iCloud or Dropbox or Google Drive, or a lot of these things sync because you know, you want it to seam seamlessly work between your computer and your, your phone. Therefore, that information is being uploaded to third-party servers. It's at that point where that third-party doctrine is introduced and the government has um, considered that uh, under this case law, you point out that, well, Connor has a lower privacy interest here. Therefore, we don't need to get a warrant. Is that a fair distinction between when it's on your actual device versus when you've uploaded it? Absolutely, yes. And I think the case is clear that the information on your phone, physically held on your phone, is, of course, subject to a warrant, not only through case law, but Utah, of course, has a statute in place that protects that as well. Really, what we are talking about, you're absolutely right, is when information is held by a third party. So it might be duplicate information that's also on your phone, but is held on a server elsewhere. Um, it also can be sort of almost like um, one way to think about it is sort of like the metadata. So the documents or information that are that are created about you by a third party simply because you have a service agreement with them. So really the third party doctrine really stems from kind of two pieces of content or stuff that you're uploading or through the third party. And this is the information that the third party is generating about you. For example, Marina, if I were to share a, a document with you through Dropbox and say, hey, check out this you know, PDF, uh, well, the PDF is my content, but then Dropbox is going to generate and store all sorts of information like who did Connor share it with? Wh uh, when did he share it? Did Marina access it? From what location? How many times did she access? Did she right. share it with other people? Mm -hmm. And that's their information. But that still, would you say, falls within this third party uh, bucket, right? Absolutely. And sometimes that sort of metadata tells just as much and can be just as implicating as the actual content in itself. And I think that was borne out in the Carpenter case. Um, you know, the, the law enforcement did not access Mr. Carpenter's actual uh, they were not able to get a transcript of the calls that he made, but simply having information about where he was, where his cell phone was, placed him at the scene of the crime and was sort of at the crux of their ability to bring a criminal case against him. So in a previous Supreme Court case, this is the Riley case, Justice Alito said that it would be very unfortunate if privacy protection in the 21st century were left primarily to the federal courts using the blunt instrument of the Fourth Amendment. Legislatures, he said, are in a better position than we are to assess and respond to the changes that have already occurred and those that almost certainly will take place in the future. So let's now step, we, we've talked about the third party doctrine, we've talked about Carpenter. Let's now uh, talk about, hey, the courts are signaling that maybe the courts are not the the sole or the primary or the only venue in which we need to address and resolve these issues. So our organizations have been working on this for a couple of years. And as a result, just in the past few days, the governor of Utah signed into law 
a, uh, a, a huge, uh, significant bill that we were able to get passed unanimously through the legislature that uh, now takes it a step further and addresses the third party doctrine. Would you explain uh, what that bill does and, and its significance? Yeah, so HB 57 um, was the number of the bill that was passed, as you mentioned, unanimously by both chambers of the Utah legislature and signed into law by the governor. And it is a really significant piece of legislation. Um, As far as I know, it's the first uh, piece of legislation in the United States to actively protect through a warrant information, electronic information held by a third party. So it definitely falls on the heels, um, both of the Carpenter case, but also on a string of legislative victories that our two organizations have shared over the years to incrementally protect people's rights, both electronically and otherwise, um, by under the Fourth Amendment by securing a warrant. Um, so it's really significant in that regard. And I think, you know, hopefully will be sort of a model in terms of other states stepping forward. The reason that it sort of picks up where Carpenter left off is that it isn't limited, like Carpenter, simply to cell service location information, which was the only type of information at issue in the Carpenter case. The statute that we worked on, HB 57, um, has a much broader definition of the types of electronic information that are subject to a warrant, even when held by a third party. So it goes beyond the Carpenter decision. That's an important uh, thing to point out. The court in the Carpenter case couldn't get the fact pattern that they did dealing with um, the cell phone location information and do all their hearings and, and focus on that issue and then suddenly come out with a, an opinion that applies more broadly to things uh, beyond the specific facts that were before them, right? This is a limitation of going through the courts that they were dealing with cell phone location information. They weren't really in a position to be able to say, well, and now that we're done this, we're just going to apply it you know, across the board to every type of data when that wasn't in the briefs, that wasn't uh, at consideration, it wasn't debated, it wasn't considered before the court. So would you say that, would you agree that that's kind of a the downside with waiting on the courts is, yay, Carpenter, it was great, it was actually very significant, we both agree with that. But as you point out, it was narrow, and if we were to would defer to the courts and wait. We got to wait for the right fact patterns to come up, hopefully broad enough and, and begin to, you know, years and decades of waiting for the court. Do you share my view that that's kind of the downside of waiting to the courts and really the reason why Alito uh, at, at a minimum was saying, hey, legislatures, you know, take this on? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I think that's always one of the limitations of a court ruling is you never know how broad or narrow that decision might be. And in this case, it was rather narrow. Nevertheless, a great win for privacy protection, but but narrow. And so, you know, I think it served as a real indicator to legislatures across the nation. Now it's your turn to pick up the mantle and go ahead and put into code the types of protections that you want to see, however broad as you might like to write them. Um, You mentioned, of course, another limitation to relying on the courts is just that it takes so much time. Courts are notoriously slow. Litigation takes years and years. Mr. Carpenter's case is is a prime example of that. It made its way up to the Supreme Court finally, and a decision was issued in 2017, but, but the actual underlying facts took place many years prior. And so waiting for many, many years to get an official ruling can be difficult when we know that technology does not wait. There are advances that are happening every day and changes. Um, You know, there's a new Apple iPhone that comes out, it seems, uh, several times a year. Um, So we see that the pace of technology is much faster than the pace of our judicial system, and we really can't wait for the courts. Legislatures must act. A tangential example that you and I had a bit of experience with this legislative session touching on the exact point you raise about new technologies coming out and and not being able to wait for the courts is biometric information and the ability of law enforcement to gain access to your device by now holding up your phone in front of your face and saying, look here. And suddenly they don't need to ask for your password and you don't have to uh, be able to divulge something that's secret with a a thumbprint or your eyeballs. Uh, Law enforcement can now gain access. These are precisely the types of issues that uh, develop quickly. And if we just wait on the courts, we're always going to be playing catch up. Another example, Marina, that I just realized yesterday in talking with our team about this bill that we didn't even bring up to the legislature. Uh, You and I have talked a little bit about this in the past, but it didn't really come up in the context of the bill that we worked on. 
the, this new law in Utah now addresses the Internet of Things, as it's called, or smart homes, where you have a yeah. internet connected thermostat, a doorbell, garage door opener, lights, all you know, your refrigerator, your oven, all these things are increasingly becoming internet enabled, generating all sorts of data about your use. And and I, I think that's kind of cool. Our law is broad enough that it covers those use cases as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned earlier the interplay between the courts and the judicial system, and I just wanted to point out that it goes both ways, right? Um, and one of the things that I think was really great about HB 57 is that it uses fairly broad language in terms of describing the type of electronic information that is subject to a warrant. And, and what I think that means is that it will now be up to the courts based on individual fact patterns that arise um, before them to interpret what what sort of the scope of that definition actually means. And, you know, to your point about the Internet of Things, how you know, what types of new electronic information that we can't even perhaps even think about right now will fall into that definition and then therefore be covered by this statute as well. So it's definitely point. that interplay moving forward as well. Let me ask you about, uh, you know, you and I both pointed out here in this interview that the bill was unanimous. And in response to that, some a listener might think, oh, no big deal, right? Like, you know, just flew through. Everyone agreed. Kumbaya. <laughs> but your laugh, so. your, your <laughs> laugh betrays what actually happened behind the scenes. So peel the curtain back a little bit. And, and how what happened before we got to that point where it was unanimous? When we first introduced this, what type of response was there? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think the the amazing success of this bill belies the challenges and controversy that that um, uh, befell us early in the session. Um, interestingly, actually, as you know, you and I both worked to get this bill heard during an interim committee um, before the legislature was officially in session. So back last fall, the bill was heard. Um, it was actually unanimously approved during that interim meeting. Um, and so we thought we were well on our way to sort of moving quickly through the legislative session. But that was not to be. Once the legislature actually opened in January of this year, the bill was heard rather quickly, and there was a tremendous amount of controversy and pushback, primarily from law enforcement. Um, and the and the leading voice speaking out against the bill was the attorney general's office. And so um, there were there were layers and layers of law enforcement, though, that, that raised objections to the bill. And you and I both spent countless hours, uh, both in meetings and drafting uh, various amendments to the bill before we finally got to a place where everybody felt comfortable with the bill moving forward. And it wasn't just law enforcement that had objections. The tech community had concerns as well. Um, other other organizations, governmental agencies initially had some concerns before those were resolved. So um, it was unanimous once, uh, once it finally got on its way, but that doesn't reveal the tremendous amount of both controversy and work that had to be put into the bill to get it to a place where people felt comfortable. So the Carpenter case we discussed earlier was an ACLU case. Uh, this is now uh, between our organizations. Certainly you guys have, have played a, a very significant part in this. This is an ACLU of Utah victory. Um, what do you do from here? Are other ACLU affiliates around the country? You guys have great infrastructure. Have you talked internally about persuading other states to follow suit? Or what does that look like for the ACLU? Yeah, so those conversations haven't happened yet. It's just been a little over um, a week or two since our legislature ended. But those conversations certainly will happen. Um, we are a, an organization that has affiliates in every state. Some states even have multiple affiliates. And we do share information and share policies and best practices. And certainly a victory in one state oftentimes does lead to similar victories in other states. So it's great to see Utah leading out on this issue. And I suspect we'll see other states follow suit. We had a write-up uh, yesterday in Tech Dirt, a tech blog, uh, where the writer was praising uh, the new law and then said at the end something to the effect of, more states should be like Utah, something you've probably <laughs> never heard before. So <laughs> while you may disagree with that uh, on a number of other issues, on this one, you and I can both stand up and say, absolutely. Uh, it's great news, very significant law. And uh, if listeners in our other uh, states uh, are interested, there's certainly organizations in your communities that you should be reaching out to. Share this episode. Tell them about House Bill 57. Reach out to the local ACLU affiliate. 
uh, talk to us here at Libertas Institute. We'd very e- uh, be very eager to help Marina Lowe, Legislative and Policy Counsel for the ACLU of Utah. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Society and the State. For show notes, archives, and more great content, visit societyandthestate.com. Thank you.